Part Five, Chapter One of An Outcast of the Islands by Joseph Conrad. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter One. Almayer, propped alone on the veranda of his house, with both his elbows on the table and holding his head between his hands, stared before him away over the stretch of sprouting young grass in his courtyard and over the short jetty with its cluster of small canoes amongst which his big whaleboat floated high like a white mother of all that dark and aquatic brood he stared on the river past the schooner anchored in midstream past the forest of the left bank he stared through and past the illusion of the material world the sun was sinking under the sky was stretched a network of white threads a network fine and close meshed where here and there were caught thicker white vapours of globular shape and to the eastward above the ragged barrier of the forest surged the summits of a chain of great clouds growing bigger slowly in imperceptible motion as if careful not to disturb the glowing stillness of the earth and the sky abreast of the house the river was empty but for the motionless schooner Higher up a solitary log came out from the bend above and went on drifting slowly down the straight reach, a dead and wandering tree going out to its grave in the sea, between two ranks of trees, motionless and living. And Almayer sat, his face in his hands, looking on and hating all this, the muddy river, the faded blue of the sky, the black log passing by on its first and last voyage, the green sea of leaves the sea that glowed shimmered and stirred above the uniform and impenetrable gloom of the forest the joyous sea of living green powdered with the brilliant dusk of oblique sun-rays he hated all this he begrudged every day every minute of his life spent amongst all these things he begrudged it bitterly angrily with enraged and immense regret like a miser compelled to give up some of his treasure to a near relation and yet all this was very precious to him. It was the present sign of a splendid future. He pushed the table away impatiently, got up, made a few steps aimlessly, then stood by the balustrade and again looked at the river, at that river which would have been the instrument for the making of his fortune if— "'What an abominable brute!' he said. He was alone, but he spoke aloud, as one is apt to do under the impulse of a strong, of an overmastering thought what a brute he muttered again the river was dark now and the schooner lay on it a black a lonely and a graceful form with the slender mast darting upwards from it in two frail and raking lines the shadows of the evening crept up the trees crept up from bow to bow till at last the long sunbeams coursing from the western horizon skimmed lightly over the topmost branches then flew upwards amongst the piled-up clouds giving them a sombre and fiery aspect in the last flush of light. And suddenly the light disappeared, as if lost in the immensity of the great blue and empty hollow overhead. The sun had set, and the forest became a straight wall of formless blackness. Above them, on the edge of lingering clouds, a single star glimmered fitfully, obscured now and then by the rapid flight of high and invisible vapors. Almayer fought with the uneasiness within his breast. He heard Ali, who moved behind him, preparing his evening meal, and he listened with strange attention to the sounds the man made, to the short dry bang of the plate put upon the table, to the clink of glass and the metallic rattle of knife and fork. The man went away. Now he was coming back. He would speak directly, and Almayer, notwithstanding the absorbing gravity of his thoughts, listened for the sound of expected words. He heard them spoken in English with painstaking distinctness. "'Ready, sir?' "'All right,' said Almayer curtly. He did not move. He remained pensive with his back to the table upon which stood the lighted lamp brought by Ali. He was thinking, where was Lingard now? Halfway down the river, probably, in Abdullah's ship. He would be back in about three days, perhaps less. And then then the schooner would have to be got out of the river and when that craft was gone they he and lingard would remain here alone with the constant thought of that other man that other man living near them what an extraordinary idea to keep him there forever forever what did that mean forever perhaps a year perhaps ten years 
preposterous keep him there ten years or maybe twenty the fellow was capable of living more than twenty years and for all that time he would have to be watched fed looked after there was nobody but lingard to have such notion twenty years why no in less than ten years their fortune would be made and they would leave this place first for batavia yes batavia and then for europe england no doubt lingard would want to go to england and would they leave that man here how would that fellow look in ten years very old probably well devil take him nina would be fifteen she would be rich and very pretty and he himself would not be so old then almayer smiled into the night yes rich why of course lingard was a resourceful man and he had plenty of money even now they were rich already but not enough decidedly not enough money brings money that gold business was good famous captain lingard was a remarkable man he said the gold was there and it was there lingard knew what he was talking about but he had queer ideas for instance about willems now what did he want to keep him alive for why that scoundrel muttered almayer again macantoine ejaculated ali suddenly very loud in a pressing tone almayer walked to the table sat down and his anxious visage dropped from above into the light thrown down by the lampshade he helped himself absently and began to eat in great mouthfuls undoubtedly lingard was the man to stick to the man undismayed masterful and ready how quickly he had planned the new future when Willem's treachery destroyed their established position in Sambir, and the position even now was not so bad. What an immense prestige that Lingard had with all those people, Arabs, Malays, and all. Ah, it was good to be able to call a man like that father. Fine. Wonder how much money really the old fellow had. People talked, they exaggerated, surely, but if he had only half of what they said. He drank, throwing his head up, and fell to it again. Now, if that Willems had known how to play his cards well, had he stuck to the old fellow he would have been in his position, he would be now married to Lingard's adopted daughter with future assured, splendid. The beast, growled Almayer between two mouthfuls. Ali stood rigidly with an uninterested face, his gaze lost in the night which pressed round the small circle of light that shone on the table, on the glass, on the bottle and on Almayer's head as he leaned over his plate, moving his jaws. A famous man, Lingard, yet you never knew what he would do next. It was notorious that he had shot a white man once for less than Willems had done. For less? Why, for nothing, so to speak. It was not even his own quarrel. It was about some melee returning from pilgrimage with wife and children, kidnapped or robbed or something, a stupid story, an old story and now he goes to see that Willems and nothing, comes back talking big about his prisoner, but after all he said very little. What did that Willems tell him? What passed between them? The old fellow must have had something in his mind when he let that scoundrel off. And Joanna, she would get round the old fellow, sure. Then he would forgive, perhaps. Impossible. But at any rate he would waste a lot of money on them. The old man was tenacious in his hates, but also in his affections. He had known that beast Willems from a boy. They would make it up in a year or so. Everything is possible. Why did he not rush off at first and kill the brute? That would have been more like Lingard. Almayer laid down his spoon suddenly, and, pushing his plate away, threw himself back in the chair. Unsafe. Decidedly unsafe. He had no mind to share Lingard's money with anybody. Lingard's money was Nina's money, in a sense, and if Willems managed to become friendly with the old man, it would be dangerous for him, Almayer. Such an unscrupulous scoundrel! He would oust him from his position, he would lie and slander, everything would be lost, lost! Poor Nina! What would become of her? Poor child! For her sake he must remove that Willems. Must! But how? Lingard wanted to be obeyed impossible to kill Willems. Lingard might be angry. Incredible, but so it was. He might. A wave of heat passed through Almayer's body, 
flushed his face and broke out of him in copious perspiration. He wriggled in his chair and pressed his hands together under the table. What an awful prospect! He fancied he could see Lingard and Willems reconciled and going away arm in arm, leaving him alone in this godforsaken hole, in Sambir, in this deadly swamp, and all his sacrifices, the sacrifice of his independence, of his best years, his surrender to Lingard's fancies and caprices, would go for nothing. Horrible! Then he thought of his little daughter, his daughter, and the ghastliness of his supposition overpowered him. He had a deep emotion, a sudden emotion that made him feel quite faint at the idea of that young life spoiled before it had fairly begun, his dear child's life. Lying back in his chair, he covered his face with both his hands. Ali glanced down at him and said unconcernedly, "'Master Finish?' Almayer was lost in the immensity of his commiseration for himself, for his daughter who was, perhaps, not going to be the richest woman in the world, notwithstanding Lingard's promises. He did not understand the other's question, and muttered through his fingers in a doleful tone. "'What did you say? What? Finish what?' "'Clean up, Messa," explained Ali. "'Clear up!' burst out Almayer with incomprehensible exasperation. "'Devil take you and the table! Stupid! Chatterer! Chalaka! Get out!' He leaned forward, glaring at his head man, then sank back in his seat with his arms hanging straight down on each side of the chair. And he sat motionless in a meditation so concentrated and so absorbing with all his power of thought so deep within himself that all expression disappeared from his face in an aspect of staring vacancy. Ali was clearing the table. He dropped negligently the tumbler into the greasy dish, flung there the spoon and fork, then slipped in the plate with a push amongst the remnants of food. He took up the dish, tucked up the bottle under his armpit, and went off. "'My hammock!' shouted Almayer after him. "'Ada, I come soon,' answered Ali from the doorway, in an offended tone, looking back over his shoulder. How could he clear the table and hang the hammock at the same time? Ya wah, these white men were all alike, wanted everything done at once, like children. The indistinct murmur of his criticism went away, faded and died out together with a soft footfall of his bare feet in the dark passage. For some time Almayer did not move. His thoughts were busy at work shaping a momentous resolution, and in the perfect silence of the house he believed that he could hear the voice of the operation as if the work had been done with a hammer. He certainly felt a thumping of strokes, faint, profound, and startling, somewhere low down in his breast, and he was aware of a sound of dull knocking, abrupt and rapid, in his ears. Now and then he held his breath, unconsciously too long, and had to relieve himself by a deep expiration that whistled dully through his pursed lips. The lamp, standing on the far side of the table, threw a section of a lighted circle on the floor, where his outstretched legs stuck out from under the table with feet rigid and turned up like the feet of a corpse, and his face, set with fixed eyes, would have been also like the face of the dead, but for its vacant yet conscious aspect the hard, the stupid, the stony aspect of one not dead, but only buried under the dust, ashes, and corruption of personal thoughts, of base fears, of selfish desires. I will do it. Not till he heard his own voice did he know that he had spoken. It startled him. He stood up. The knuckles of his hand, somewhat behind him, were resting on the edge of the table as he remained still with one foot advanced, his lips a little open, and thought, it would not do to fool about with Lingard, but I must risk it. It's the only way I can see. I must tell her. She has some little sense. I wish they were a thousand miles off already, a hundred thousand miles, I do. And if it fails, and she blabs out then to Lingard, she seemed a fool. No, probably they will get away. And if they did, would Lingard believe me? Yes, I never lied to him. He would believe. I don't know. Perhaps he wouldn't. I must do it. Must, he argued aloud to himself. For a long time he stood still, looking before him with an intense gaze, a gaze rapt and immobile that seemed to watch the minute quivering of a delicate balance coming to a rest. To the left of him, in the whitewashed wall of the house that formed the back of the veranda, there was a closed door. Black letters were painted on it proclaiming the fact that behind that door 
there was the office of Lingard and Company. The interior had been furnished by Lingard when he had built the house for his adopted daughter and her husband, and it had been furnished with reckless prodigality. There was an office desk, a revolving chair, bookshelves, a safe, all to humor the weakness of Almayer, who thought all those paraphernalia necessary to successful trading. Lingard had laughed, but had taken immense trouble to get the things. It pleased him to make his protégé, his adopted son-in-law, happy. It had been the sensation of Sambir some five years ago. While the things were being landed, the whole settlement literally lived on the river bank in front of the Rajah Laut's house to look, to wonder, to admire. What a big mesa, with many boxes fitted all over it and under it! What did the white man do with such a table? And look, look, O oh brothers, there is a green square box with a gold plate on it, a box so heavy that those twenty men cannot drag it up the bank. Let us go, brothers, and help pull at the ropes, and perchance we may see what's inside. Treasure, no doubt. Gold is heavy and hard to hold, O oh brothers. Let us go and earn a recompense from the fierce Rajah of the sea who shouts over there with a red face. See, there is a man carrying a pile of books from the boat. What a number of books! What were they for? And an old invalided Jeremudi, who had travelled over many seas, and had heard holy men speak in far-off countries, explained to a small knot of unsophisticated citizens of Sambir that those books were books of magic, of magic that guides the white men's ships over the seas, that gives them their wicked wisdom and their strength, of magic that makes them great, powerful, and irresistible while they live, and, praise be to Allah, the victims of Satan, the slaves of Jehanimum, when they die. And when he saw the room furnished, Almayer had felt proud. In his exaltation of an empty-headed quill-driver, he thought himself, by the virtue of that furniture, at the head of a serious business. He had sold himself to Lingard for these things, married the Malay girl of his adoption for the reward of these things, and of the great wealth that must necessarily follow upon conscientious bookkeeping. He found out very soon that trade in Sambir meant something entirely different. He could not guide Patalolo, control the irrepressible old Sahanamin, or restrain the youthful vagaries of the fierce Bahasin with, with pen, ink, and paper. He found no successful magic in the blank pages of his ledgers, and gradually he lost his old point of view in the saner appreciation of his situation. The room, known as the office, became neglected then like a temple of an exploded superstition. At first, when his wife reverted to her original savagery, Almayer, now and again, had sought refuge from her there. But after their child began to speak, to know him, he became braver, for he found courage and consolation in his unreasoning and fierce affection for his daughter, in the impenetrable mantle of selfishness he wrapped round both their lives, round himself and that young life that was also his. When Lingard ordered him to receive Joanna into his house, he had a truckle bed put into the office, the only room he could spare. The big office desk was pushed on one side, and Joanna came with her little shabby trunk and with her child, and took possession in her dreamy, slack, half-asleep way, took possession of the dust, dirt, and squalor where she appeared naturally at home, where she dragged a melancholy and dull existence an existence made up of sad remorse and frightened hope, amongst the hopeless disorder, the senseless and vain decay of all these emblems of civilized commerce. Bits of white stuff, rags yellow, pink, blue, rags limp, brilliant and soiled, trailed on the floor, lay on the desk amongst the somber covers of books soiled, grimy but stiff-backed in virtue, perhaps, of their European origin. The biggest set of bookshelves was partly hidden by a petticoat, the waistband of which was caught upon the back of a slender book pulled a little way out of the row so as to make an improvised clothes peg. The folding canvas bedstead stood nearly in the middle of the room, stood anyhow parallel to no wall, as if it had been, in the process of transportation to some remote place, dropped casually there by tired bearers. And on the tumbled blankets that lay in a disordered heap on its edge, Joanna sat almost all day with her stockingless feet upon one of the bed-pillows that were somehow always kicking about the floor. She sat there, vaguely tormented at times by the thought of her absent husband, but most of the time thinking tearfully of nothing at all, looking with swimming eyes at her little son, at the big-headed, pasty-faced, 
in sickly Lewis Willems, who rolled a glass inkstand solid with dried ink about the floor, and tottered after it with a portentous gravity of demeanour and absolute absorption by the business in hand that characterised the pursuits of early childhood. Through the half-open shutter a ray of sunlight, a ray merciless and crude, came into the room, beat in the early morning upon the safe in the far-off corner, then travelling against the sun, cut at midday the big desk in two with its solid and clean-edged brilliance, with its hot brilliance in which a swarm of flies hovered in dancing flight over some dirty plate forgotten there amongst yellow papers for many a day. And towards the evening the cynical ray seemed to cling to the ragged petticoat, lingered on it with wicked enjoyment of that misery it had exposed all day, lingered on the corner of the dusty bookshelf, in a red glow, intense and mocking, till it was suddenly snatched by the setting sun out of the way of the coming night. And the night entered the room. The night abrupt, impenetrable, and all filling with its flood of darkness, the night cool and merciful, the blind night that saw nothing but could hear the fretful whimpering of the child, the creak of the bedstead, Joanna's deep sighs as she turned over, sleepless, in the confused conviction of her wickedness, thinking of that man masterful, fair-headed and strong, a man hard, perhaps, but her husband, her clever and handsome husband, to whom she had acted so cruelly on the advice of bad people if her own people, and of her poor, dear, deceived mother. To Almayer Joanna's presence was a constant worry, a worry unobtrusive yet intolerable, a constant but mostly mute warning of possible danger. In view of the absurd softness of Lingard's heart, every one in whom Lingard manifested the slightest interest was to Almayer a natural enemy. He was quite alive to that feeling, and in the intimacy of the secret intercourse with his inner self had often congratulated himself upon his own wide-awake comprehension of his position. In that way, and impelled by that motive, Almayer had hated many and various persons at various times. But he never had hated and feared anybody so much as he did hate and fear Willems. Even after Willems' treachery, which seemed to remove him beyond the pale of all human sympathy, Almayer distrusted the situation and groaned in spirit every time he caught sight of Joanna. He saw her very seldom in the daytime, but in the short and opal-tinted twilights, or in the azure dusk of starry evenings, he often saw, before he slept, the slender and tall figure trailing to and fro the ragged tail of its white gown over the dried mud of the riverside in front of the house. Once or twice when he sat late on the veranda, with his feet upon the deal-table on a level with the lamp, reading the seven-months-old copy of the North China Herald brought by Lingard, he heard the stairs creak, and, looking round the paper, he saw her frail and meagre form rise step by step and toil across the veranda, carrying with difficulty the big fat child whose head lying on the mother's bony shoulder seemed of the same size as Joanna's own. Several times she had assailed him with tearful clamour or mad entreaties, asking about her husband, wanting to know where he was, when he would be back, and ending every such outburst with despairing and incoherent self-reproaches that were absolutely incomprehensible to Almayer. On one or two occasions she had overwhelmed her host with vituperative abuse, making him responsible for her husband's absence. Those scenes, begun without any warning, ended abruptly in a sobbing flight and a bang of the door, stirred the house with a sudden, a fierce, and an evanescent disturbance, like those inexplicable whirlwinds that rise, run, and vanish without apparent cause upon the sun-scorched dead level of arid and lamentable plains. But to-night the house was quiet, deadly quiet, while Almayer stood still, watching that delicate balance where he was weighing all his chances. Joanna's intelligence, Lingard's credulity, Willem's reckless audacity, desire to escape, readiness to seize an unexpected opportunity. He weighed, anxious and attentive, his fears and his desires, against the tremendous risk of a quarrel with Lingard. Yes, Lingard would be angry. Lingard might suspect him of some connivance in his prisoner's escape, but surely he would not quarrel with him, Almayer, about those people once they were gone, gone to the devil in their own way. And then he had hold of Lingard through the little girl. Good, what an annoyance, a prisoner! 
as if one could keep him in there. He was bound to get away some time or other, of course. A situation like that can't last. Anybody could see that. Lingard's eccentricity passed all bounds. You may kill a man, but you mustn't torture him. It was almost criminal. It caused worry, trouble, and unpleasantness. Almayer for a moment felt very angry with Lingard. He made him responsible for the anguish he suffered from, for the anguish of doubt and fear, for compelling him, the practical and innocent Almayer, to such painful efforts of mind in order to find out some issue for absurd situations created by the unreasonable sentimentality of Lingard's unpractical impulses. Now, if the fellow were dead, it would be all right, said Almayer to the veranda. He stirred a little, and scratching his nose thoughtfully, reveled in a short flight of fancy, showing him his own image crouching in a big boat that floated arrested, say fifty yards off, abreast of Willem's landing place. In the bottom of the boat there was a gun, a loaded gun. One of the boatmen would shout, and Willems would answer from the bushes. The rascal would be suspicious, of course. Then the man would wave a piece of paper urging Willems to come to the landing place and receive an important message. From the Raja Laut the man would yell as the boat edged inshore, and that would fetch Willems out. Wouldn't it, rather? And Almayer saw himself jumping up at the right moment, taking aim, pulling the trigger, and Willems tumbling over, his head in the water. The swine! He seemed to hear the report of the shot. It made him thrill from head to foot where he stood. How simple! Unfortunate! Lingard! He sighed, shook his head. Pity! couldn't be done, and couldn't leave him there either. Suppose the Arabs were to get hold of him again, for instance, to lead an expedition up the river. Goodness only knows what harm would come of it. The balance was at rest now, and inclining to the side of immediate action. Almayer walked to the door, walked up very close to it, knocked loudly, and turned his head away, looking frightened for a moment at what he had done. After waiting for a while, he put his ear against the panel and listened nothing. He composed his features into an agreeable expression while he stood listening and thinking to himself. I hear her, crying, eh? I believe she has lost the little wits she had, and is crying night and day since I began to prepare her for the news of her husband's death, as Lingard told me. I wonder what she thinks. It's just like her father to make me invent all these stories for nothing at all. Out of kindness, kindness, damn, she isn't deaf, surely. He knocked again, then said in a friendly tone, grinning benevolently at the closed door, "'It's me, Mrs. Willems. I want to speak to you. I have, have important news. What is it?' The "'News,' repeated Almayer distinctly. "'News about your husband. Your husband! Damn him!' he added under his breath. He heard a stumbling rush inside. Things were overturned. Joanna's agitated voice cried, "'News? What? What? I am coming out.' "'No!' shouted Almayer. Put on some clothes, Mrs. Willems, and let me in. It's very confidential. You have a candle, haven't you? She was knocking herself about blindly amongst the furniture in that room. The candlestick was upset. Matches were struck ineffectually. The matchbox fell. He heard her drop on her knees and grope over the floor while she kept on moaning in maddened distraction. Oh, my God! News! Yes, yes! Ah, where, where? Candle! Oh, my God! I can't find! don't go away for the love of heaven. I don't want to go away, said Almayer, impatiently through the keyhole, but look sharp. It's kind of, it's pressing. He stamped his foot lightly, waiting with his hand on the door handle. He thought anxiously, the woman's a perfect idiot. Why should I go away? She will be off her head. She will never catch my meaning. She's too stupid. She was moving now inside the room hurriedly and in silence. He waited. There was a moment of perfect stillness in there, and then she spoke in an exhausted voice, in words that were shaped out of an expiring sigh, out of a sigh light and profound, like words breathed out by a woman before going off into a dead faint. Come in. He pushed the door. Ali, coming through the passage, with an arm full of pillows and blankets pressed to his breast high up under his chin, caught sight of his master before the door closed behind him. He was so astonished that he dropped his bundle and stood staring at the door for a long time. He heard the voice of his master talking, talking to that Sarani woman. Who was she? 
he had never thought about that really he speculated for a while hazily upon things in general she was a sarani woman and ugly he made a disdainful grimace picked up the bedding and went about his work slinging the hammock before two uprights of the veranda those things did not concern him she was ugly and brought here by the rajah lout and his master spoke to her in the night very well he ali had his work to do sling the hammock go round and see that the watchmen were awake take a look at the moorings of the boats at the padlock of the big storehouse then go to sleep to sleep he shivered pleasantly he leaned with both arms over his master's hammock and fell into a light doze a scream unexpected piercing a scream beginning at once on the highest pitch of a woman's voice and then cut short so short that it suggested the swift work of death caused ali to jump on one side away from the hammock and the silence that succeeded seemed to him as startling as the awful shriek he was thunderstruck with surprise almayer came out of the office leaving the door ajar passed close to his servant without taking any notice and made straight for the water chatty hung on a nail in a draughty place he took it down and came back missing the petrified ali by an inch he moved with long strides yet notwithstanding his haste stopped short before the door and throwing his head back poured a thin stream of water down his throat while he came and went while he stopped to drink while he did all this there came steadily from the dark room the sound of feeble and persistent crying the crying of a sleepy and frightened child after he had drunk almayer went in closing the door carefully ali did not budge that sarani woman shrieked he felt an immense curiosity very unusual to his stolid disposition he could not take his eyes off the door was she dead in there how interesting and funny he stood with open mouth till he heard again the rattle of the door handle master coming out he pivoted on his heels with great rapidity and made believe to be absorbed in the contemplation of the night outside he heard almayer moving about behind his back chairs were displaced his master sat down ali said almayer his face was gloomy and thoughtful he looked at his head man who had approached the table then he pulled out his watch it was going whenever lingard was in sambir ali's watch was going he would set it by the cabin clock telling himself every time that he really must keep that watch going for the future and every time when lingard went away he would let it run down and would measure his weariness by sunrises and sunsets in an apathetic indifference to mere hours to hours only to hours that had no importance in sambir life in the tired stagnation of empty days when nothing mattered to him but the quality of the gutta and the size of the rattans when there were no small hopes to be watched for where to him there was nothing interesting nothing supportable nothing desirable to expect nothing bitter but the slowness of the passing days nothing sweet but the hope the distant and glorious hope the hope wearying aching and precious of getting away he looked at the watch half past eight ali waited stolidly go to the settlement said almayer and tell mahmat banjer to come and speak to me to-night ali went off muttering he did not like his errand banjer and his two brothers were bajau vagabonds who had appeared lately in sambir and had been allowed to take possession of a tumble-down abandoned hut on three posts belonging to lingard and company and standing just outside their fence ali disapproved of the favour shown to those stranger any kind of dwelling was valuable in sambir at that time and if master did not want that old rotten house he might have given it to him ali who was his servant instead of bestowing it upon those bad men everyone knew they were bad it was well known that they had stolen a boat from hinapari who was very aged and feeble and had no sons and that afterwards by the truculent recklessness of their demeanour they had frightened the poor old man into holding his tongue about it yet everybody knew of it it was one of the tolerated scandals of sambir disapproved and accepted a manifestation of that base acquiescence in success of that inexpressed and cowardly toleration of strength that exists infamous and irremediable at the bottom of all hearts in all societies whenever men congregate in bigger and more virtuous places than sambir and in sambir also where as in other places one man could steal a boat with impunity while another would have no right to look at the paddle 
Allmeyer, leaning back in his chair, meditated. The more he thought, the more he felt convinced that Banjer and his brothers were exactly the men he wanted. Those fellows were sea gypsies, and could disappear without attracting notice, and if they returned, nobody, and Lingard least of all, would dream of seeking information from them. Moreover, they had no personal interest of any kind in Sambir affairs, had taken no sides, would know nothing anyway he called in a strong voice, "'Mrs. Willems!' She came out quickly, almost startling him, so much did she appear as though she had surged up through the floor on the other side of the table. The lamp was between them, and Almeyer moved it aside, looking up at her from his chair. She was crying. She was crying gently, silently, in a ceaseless welling up of tears that did not fall in drops, but seemed to overflow in a clear sheet from under her eyelids seemed to flow at once all over her face, her cheeks, and over her chin that glistened with moisture in the light. Her breast and her shoulders were shaken repeatedly by a convulsive and noiseless catching in her breath, and after every spasmodic sob her sorrowful little head, tied up in a red kerchief, trembled on her long neck round which her bony hand gathered and clasped a disarranged dress. "'Compose yourself, Mrs. Willems,' said Almeyer. She emitted an inarticulate sound that seemed to be a faint, a very far off, a hardly audible cry of mortal distress. Then the tears went on flowing in profound stillness. You must understand that I have told you all this because I am your friend, real friend, said Almeyer, after looking at her for some time with visible dissatisfaction. You, his wife, ought to know the danger he is in. Captain Lingard is a terrible man, you know she blubbered out, sniffing and sobbing together. "'Do you, you, you speak the, the truth now?' "'Upon my word of honour, upon the head of my child,' protested Almeyer. "'I had to deceive you till now because of Captain Lingard. But I couldn't bear it. Think only what a risk I run in telling you. If ever Lingard was to know, why should I do it? Pure friendship. Dear Peter was my colleague in Makassa for years, you know what shall i do what shall i do she exclaimed faintly looking around on every side as if she could not make up her mind which way to rush off you must help him to clear out now lingard is away he offended lingard and that's no joke lingard said he would kill him he will do it too said almayer earnestly she wrung her hands oh the wicked man the wicked wicked man she moaned swaying her body from side to side "'Yes, yes, he is terrible,' assented Almeyer. "'You must not lose any time, I say. Do you understand me, Mrs. Willems? Think of your husband, of your poor husband. How happy he will be. You will bring him his life, actually his life. Think of him.' She ceased her swaying movement, and now, with her head sunk between her shoulders, she hugged herself with both her arms, and she stared at Almeyer with wild eyes, while her teeth chattered, rattling violently and uninterruptedly, with a very loud sound in the deep peace of the house. "'Oh, mother of God!' she wailed. "'I am a miserable woman. Will he forgive me? The poor, innocent man. Will he forgive me? Oh, Mr. Almeyer, he is so severe. Oh, help me. I dare not. You don't know what I've done to him. I daren't. I can't. God help me!' The last words came in a despairing cry. Had she been flayed alive, she could not have sent to heaven a more terrible, a more heart-rending and anguish plaint. "'Shh! shh!' hissed Almeyer, jumping up. "'You will wake up everybody with your shouting.' She kept on sobbing then without any noise, and Almeyer stared at her in boundless astonishment. The idea that maybe he had done wrong by confiding in her upset him so much that for a moment he could not find a connected thought in his head. At last he said, "'I swear to you that your husband is in such a position that he would welcome the devil. Listen well to me, the devil himself, if the devil came to him in a canoe. Unless I am mistaken, he added, under his breath, then again loudly, if you have any little difference to make up with him, I assure to you, I swear to you, this is your time. The ardently persuasive tone of his words, he thought, would have carried irresistible conviction to a craven image. He noticed with satisfaction that Joanna seemed to have got some inkling of his meaning. He continued, speaking slowly, Look here, Mrs. Willems, I can't do anything, daren't, but I will tell you what I will do. There will come here in about ten minutes a Bugis man. You know the language, you are from Akasa. He has a large canoe, he can take you there, to the new Rajas clearing, tell him. 
they are three brothers ready for anything if you pay them. You have got some money, haven't you? She stood, perhaps listening, but giving no sign of intelligence, and stared at the floor in sudden immobility, as if the horror of the situation, the overwhelming sense of her own wickedness and of her husband's great danger had stunned her brain, her heart, her will, had left her no faculty but that of breathing and of keeping on her feet. Almayer swore to himself with much mental profanity that he had never seen a more useless, a more stupid being. "'Do you hear me?' he said, raising his voice. "'Do try to understand. Have you got any money? Money? Dollars? Gilders? Money? What's the matter with you?' Without raising her eyes she said in a voice that sounded weak and undecided, as if she had been making a desperate effort of memory, the house has been sold. Mr. Hudig was angry. Almayer gripped the edge of the table with all his strength. He resisted manfully an almost uncontrollable impulse to fly at her and box her ears. It was sold for money, I suppose, with studied and incisive calmness. Have you got it? Who has got it? She looked up at him, raising her swollen eyelids with a great effort, in a sorrowful expression of her drooping mouth, of her whole besmudged and tear-stained face she whispered resignedly. Leonard has some. He wanted to get married. And Uncle Antonio, he sat at the door and would not go away. And Agostina, she is so poor, and so many, many children, little children, and Louise, the engineer. He never said a word against my husband, also our cousin Maria. She came and shouted, and my head was so bad, and my heart was worse. Then cousin Salvador, and old Daniel de Souza, who— Almayer had listened to her speechless with rage. He thought, I must give money now to that idiot, must, must get her out of the way now before Lingard is back. He made two attempts to speak before he managed to burst out, I don't want to know their blasted names. Tell me, did all those infernal people leave you anything? To you, that's what I want to know. I have two hundred and fifteen dollars, said Joanna in a frightened tone. Almayer breathed freely. He spoke with great friendliness. That will do. It isn't much, but it will do. Now when the man comes, I will be out of the way. You speak to him. Give him some money, only a little mind, and promise more. Then when you get there, you will be guided by your husband, of course. And don't forget to tell him that Captain Lingard is at the mouth of the river, the northern entrance. You will remember, won't you? The northern branch. Lingard is death. Joanna shivered. Almayer went on rapidly. I would have given you money if you had wanted it, upon my word. Tell your husband I've sent you to him, and tell him not to lose any time, and also say to him from me that we shall meet some day, that I could not die happy unless I met him once more, only once. I love him, you know, I prove it. Tremendous risk to me this business is. Joanna snatched his hand, and before he knew what she would be at, pressed it to her lips. "'Mrs. Willems, don't. What are you?' cried the abashed Almayer, tearing his hand away. "'Oh, you are good,' she cried, with sudden exultation. "'You are noble. I shall pray every day. To all the saints I shall—' "'Never mind, never mind,' stammered out Almayer confusedly, without knowing very well what she was saying. "'Only look out for Lingard. I am happy to be able, in your sad situation. Believe me.' They stood with the table between them, Joanna looking down, and her face in the half-light above the lamp appeared like a soiled carving of old ivory, a carving with accentuated anxious hollows of old, very old ivory. Almayer looked at her, mistrustful, hopeful. He was saying to himself, how frail she is. I could upset her by blowing at her. She seems to have got some idea of what must be done, but will she have the strength to carry it through? I must trust to luck now. Somewhere far in the back courtyard, Ali's voice rang suddenly in angry remonstrance. "'Why did you shut the gate, O father of all mischief? You are a watchman. You are only a wild man. Did I not tell you I was coming back, you?' "'I am off, Mrs. Willems,' exclaimed Almayer. "'That man is here with my servant. Be calm. Try to—' He heard the footsteps of the two men in the passage, and without finishing his sentence ran rapidly down the steps towards the riverside. End of chapter 1 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's audiobooks dot com